See You Now is a podcast highlighting the innovative and human-centered solutions that nurses are coming up with to solve for today's most challenging healthcare problems. Created in collaboration with Johnson & Johnson and the American Nurses Association and hosted by nurse economist and health tech specialist, Shauna Butler. You know, we all just don't want to lose symptoms of diseases or disorders or, or circumstances. We need to thrive and we need to flourish. I always think of safety as not the absence of threat, but the ability to feel safe enough, to feel comfortable enough to be able to express yourself. And I think we leave a lot on the table in terms of opportunity costs when we're not living our most full lives through this sense of self-expression as a maker, but also as a beholder of other people's expressions. I consider any form of self-expression an art, anything anything. It could be visual arts, it could be performing arts, it could be digital arts, it could be culinary arts. You don't have to be good at an art form in order for it to have tremendous effect on your physiology and psychology. It's really about creation. It's really about finding your voice, sharing your voice, and celebrating voice. We're really working to put together a narrative to show at all these different intersections What's the evidence that's supporting arts for health and well-being and learning? We want to understand more about how the arts help us heal, because when we understand that, we can heal more and we can heal better. And we can hopefully create the sustainability of these really extraordinary tools that we are hardwired for. Welcome to See You Now. I'm Shauna Butler. You know, the arts, there's just something magical, majestic, and at times mysterious about the persuasive powers they have over our emotions, bodies, and souls, even our choices and directions in life. It's that feeling of awe, wonder, curiosity, and hope that greets you when looking at the sun pouring through stained glass, when you hear the sweet voices of a children's choir, delight in a beautifully set table or a star-filled night sky. It's a power that human beings and artists across cultures and throughout time have experienced and appreciated, but one that hasn't been well understood by science or scientists or widely adopted in medicine and public health as cure or care in treating symptoms, disease, or fostering well-being. Thankfully, that's changing. In this two-part arts-infused episode, we explore and learn from two very different experts how the arts, broadly defined, offer profound and enduring benefits to our brains, bodies, and behavior. How healthcare is tapping into the wide range of art to give a voice to trauma, address isolation, and support our frontline healthcare team's resiliency and well being. And that we are wired for art. I'm Susan Max Salmon, and I'm the executive director of the International Arts and Mind Lab, which is the Center for Applied Neuroaesthetics at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. And I'm also proud to serve as the co-director of the Neuro Arts Blueprint with the Aspen Institute. And I think right now I am most excited about the potential of the blueprint to really create a global network that brings together all of the folks that are interested in the arts for health, well-being, and learning. Neuro arts. What is science saying about the role of arts in health, well-being, and healing? Well, the science is catching up with the artists and what artists have always known about the value of the arts and aesthetic experiences to heal us. So over the last 20 years, since we've been able to literally get inside our heads non-invasively, we've started to learn a lot more about neuroplasticity, about the role of the default mode network, about something that we call the aesthetic triad around the role of enriched environments to really change synaptic connectivity. So we know a whole lot more about the role of neurotransmitters and hormones that the arts impact and how they can really have a tremendous impact on the way we feel, um, the way we feel physiologically, the way we feel mentally, and really how it, they even influence our behavior. How did you get interested in this? There's usually a good story behind all of this. <laughs> I've been interested in this area my whole life. I'm a twin. 
I was born in relationship and um, I was always very keen to understand sensory stimuli, how we how touch, how smell, how hearing, how all of these ways we bring the world in affected me and my sister. And as a kid, I was always really in nature. I found that nature was my art. Uh, I was always outside in bare feet until the sun went down. When I was about 12 years old, my parents had bought property. We were building a farm, a horse farm, and we were out clearing stones off of a big field one late afternoon, cold November day. And I was sitting by the fire, warming my hands. My father and my sisters were picking up rocks and putting them into a crate. Somehow the crate spilled over and trapped my sister underneath of it. And so I heard the screaming and I went running and I did that thing where you literally lift um, a ton of stones. Adrenaline kicked in, yeah. Off my sister. And they were able to save her leg, but she had a very, very long recovery. And during that recovery, she stayed at home through something called home and hospital. And initially out of boredom, someone suggested to her, maybe she should start drawing. And my sister from the accident was incredibly traumatized. Our, our whole family was. So my sister started drawing. And what I saw was that I was able to access parts of my sister through her artwork that I couldn't access in the ways that we always had through these very sensorial relationships, you know, almost um, through telepathy. And um, she was able to find visual symbols and metaphors that expressed the trauma and the pain and the fear that she really had and could then show me because she then understood it. That's when I really understood that art spoke a language that far transcended anything that I had known before. And then as she got better, um, I have four sisters, five girls in her family, and we always would put on shows. And what was very clear early on was I couldn't dance, couldn't sing, couldn't write, couldn't play piano, but I got more benefit out of these extraordinary art forms in terms of identity, collaboration, self-confidence, communication, you know, a sense of meaning in the world. And it just stuck with me. So as I went through undergraduate school, my first degree was in therapeutic recreation and arts, working with children that had a range of both physical and intellectual disabilities. Then I ultimately got a degree in communications. How do you use these different art forms to communicate? And then I got an MBA in order to work with cultural arts organizations and nonprofit organizations to help them think about how do you scale and grow this work. And along the way, started a couple companies, one called Curiosity Kits, uh, another one called Curiosityville, all very interested in the role of the arts to help us learn, but also in well-being. And ultimately, I was invited to work at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine to build a program called the Arts and Mind Lab. That's a translational lab where we really look at the neurobiology of the arts and also other ways of knowing and how you can translate that knowledge into practice and work with practitioners to really think about a bi-directional way of how do you build this work. That is um, such a powerful story of your family, your sister and your family. And pretty much every innovation that I know of in healthcare, it's driven because of people's experience or their pain. You know, something something really bad happened and they want to make it better or they don't want other people to have to suffer in the same way. Yeah. So empathy driven innovation is incredibly powerful. And I think it's ever present in, in health. As you're describing that, that connection between the arts, the brain, health and well-being, how are the discoveries of these connections scientifically being made? So unfortunately, the arts have not been well funded um, at a national level, um, and especially in a, from a basic science point of view, until about the last six years or so, when Francis Collins... Um, Francis Collins, the director of the National Institutes of Health? Yeah, yeah. He really stepped up and said, we're very interested in funding music and sound and beginning to try to understand the neurobiology of music and sound. And, and by understanding those mechanisms, how we can really move those 
further along the continuum in terms of uh, a continuum of care. He has been a staunch advocate for the role of the arts at large, but started with music because it has always been the most studied art form. And there was a sense that let's start in this sort of rich area and then we can build out. And I think that's going to happen. So with this funding, which has been about $50 million, there has been quite a bit of research done. And now a toolbox has been created for researchers to use that looks at how do you define outcome measures. So that work is really happening like science does from different angles. So there are people like Charles Lim, who has been studying improvisation and looking at the prefrontal cortex, folks like Nina Krauss, who are looking at other aspects of the way the brain changes on sound and music. Um, There's folks that are looking at USD, who are looking more at social emotional learning and young children, and many other examples of looking at things like music and dance and gait, mood and even cognition for people with Parkinson's disease. So sometimes there's basic science and sometimes there's really great clinical science. And then there's also more applied work in terms of things like public health or rehabilitation or thinking about community arts. So there's quite a bit of data that we're really working to put together a narrative to show at all these different intersections, what's the evidence that's supporting arts for health and well-being and learning. That health, well-being, recovery, healing, trauma, the arts have been pretty well known as far as a therapy, you know, in, in healthcare. We've we've used that for a long time. Even if the science and the evidence wasn't there, I think that people just knew in their being and also what they experienced. There's been this really interesting shift in focus on our healthcare workforce. Mm -hmm. Those people over the past several years who have been very frontline in our economy and kept things moving and kept things going and have been depleted, exhausted, uh, facing all sorts of traumas that were just unprecedented. At this moment in time, our healthcare workforce are increasingly turning to the arts as a means for self-care, as a means for recovery, as a means for healing. What do we need to know about neuro arts, um, the arts specifically in healing our healers, and then as we are healing to also protect their well-being and their health as individuals, as communities, as health systems? A big question, but I think that this is a really interesting moment because all the art forms, movement, poetry, singing, dance, um, drawing, we're seeing these being used in healthcare. So what do you know about that and what do we need to know about it? Yeah, it's, it's really an extraordinarily sad reality that healthcare workers and that's clinicians, staff, nurses, all of the folks that are involved in any aspect of healthcare have really been brought to their knees and they show up every day, um, every day. And of course, you know, you're seeing the mental health issues emerging um, I guess a couple things in terms of burnout, sort of at that very worst place where physical health is also affected because mental health is, is such an extreme and there's fatigue. We have been doing quite a bit of work at Hopkins and are in the process of building a recharge center that's the first in the, in the country that looks at both biophilic spaces, virtual reality. We're using vibration in the form of a tune bed. And then also what I like to call low tech, high touch. So that's drawing, doodling, expressive writing, knitting, crochet, collage, also looking at um, offering different kinds of very simple ways to um, engage in different types of art experiences, like singing in the shower, humming in the car, Um, but making these arts practices part of your everyday to really address some of the very severe aspects of burnout. And then looking at stress and anxiety, thinking about how these practices can really be something that you use as part of your daily routine. There's a really interesting um, study done by James Pennebaker, University of Texas, Austin, looking at the use of expressive writing. When you can bring those feelings to the page, they often don't get lodged inside your body. And so the act of just expressing them, even if you don't share them with anybody else. So something as simple as being able to do journaling or note taking where you're really beginning to kind of let those things go. Um, More extreme cases when 
people are really stuck in embodying that pain. We've seen visual arts be really helpful in creating symbol and metaphor so that you're then able to come back and add a narrative where your brain has not been able to find words. You're able to find words because you've created these symbols to give you breadcrumbs, if you will, to be able to begin to start to piece together what's happened. And oftentimes um, in the healthcare environment, when there's these very easy access points through the arts, you can then see where someone might need additional help, where they may need to see a counselor or a therapist that can help them address and move through some of this work. And there is some really great work around this uh, related to race. For many years, people of color have held trauma, like we're seeing healthcare workers hold trauma. And we can take a major lesson from the way dance has helped African-American communities move through trauma or live with trauma. Someone said to me recently, for many, it's not post-traumatic stress, it's ongoing constant traumatic stress. And I think that's true for healthcare workers too. So being able to look at other cultures, other communities that are living through this is a really great example of how you use lived experience also to be able to think about moving through that. I'll also say the act of eating together and food, there's some really interesting research that's showing that just breaking bread with each other and having that time lower stress makes us more open and actually is very helpful in resolving conflict. So um, I think that's also very interesting. And what we have heard time and time again is that you don't have to be good at an art form in order for it to have tremendous effect on your physiology and psychology. That's so good to hear because oftentimes I will hear people say, I don't sing or I don't dance. I don't think of myself as a singer that others might want to listen to, (laughs) but there is benefit not only for myself, but for others when I'm participating. And when you mentioned the, the piece about eating together, it reminds me, it's been over a decade. I was taking care of a patient in Hungary and I was in one of their hospitals there. First time I'd ever seen this, but one of the things that they do to improve their care as teams and to take care of each other every single day, they had lunch together. And I'm so accustomed in most of our hospitals where we have a doctor's lounge, a nurse's lounge, all the specialties have their spaces they go to. None of that existed there. And it was a a part of the practice where everybody ate together and where I saw so much interesting connection and um, checking in with each other. It was Mm -hmm. really beautiful. So when you said that eating together, it reminded me of the power of breaking bread together and why that's such an important part of so many of our traditions, you know, that there is a meal that that we share. And it does remind us of those shared cultural values. Um, well, isolation and, um, you know, a sense of belonging to the community is so important. And I think that that's part of what that is, is where do you fit and what, what's the meaning of that for you? And, and I think we we're so transactional that we've forgotten how transformational we need to be and how we're wired as social beings. And the more we're separated in some ways because of technology, but also because of our very, very busy lives, we don't stop to just check in. And that checking in really makes a huge difference. One of the things that I've learned from you and from the neuro arts is we are wired for art. Uh, And you just mentioned, you know, a couple of those different forms and things that I would not have considered, like sharing a meal or eating, you know, maybe baking. So how, you know, when you think about the arts and aesthetics, what forms do they take? Um, How are we expanding that so that we have more tools to work with? So we've actually spent a lot of time thinking about what are arts. And I consider any form of self-expression an art. And that could be... um, Anything, anything. It could be visual arts. It could be performing arts. It could be digital arts. It could be culinary arts. We've identified about 10 different categories of arts. Um, But the reality is with technology, there are new art forms being born every day. And that's going to continue. Someone recently showed me yo-yo performance as an art form. And I think if you really let go of the mythology around what the fine arts are and what art means, it's really about creation. It's really about sharing your voice, finding your voice and celebrating voice. And 
we spend our lifetimes figuring out how to do that. So if we can expand our minds to what art means, that gives us tremendous liberty. Even if you just thought about literary arts for a minute, we have poetry, we have spoken word, we have haiku. Every culture has their own form of literary art that may be different than other cultures or maybe overlapping, but open our minds to what self-expression really means. And what happens is, you know, I always think of safety as not the absence of threat, but the ability to feel safe enough, to feel comfortable enough to be able to express yourself. And so, um, you know, we should really open up this idea. Another big mythology is that, you know, it's music, dance, writing, that these are very fine disciplines. But in fact, I think the arts are quite broad and quite expansive. I had a discussion with a colleague about, well, culinary arts really aren't an art. And I was like, are you kidding? Any way we bring the world in through. I mean, have they not seen all the, the Instagram of uh, sourdough bread? Right, right, right. I've now <laughs> charcuterie changed charcuterie boards. Oh my gosh. I've gorgeous. changed her mind. Think about the pleasure and the mm-hmm. reward yeah. of thinking that food is an art. And I think that's another thing that's worth stating is that you know, we all just don't want to lose symptoms of diseases or disorders or or circumstances. We need to thrive and we need to flourish. And I think we leave a lot on the table in terms of opportunity costs when we're not living our most full lives through this sense of self-expression as a maker, but also as a beholder of other people's expressions and the things that they want to say, whether they're sad or happy or complicated, to be able to open the space to have these richer discussions and richer experiences really is in service of humanity. Yeah, there's beauty in hard things. Mm. Uh, When I think about filmmakers, when I think about photographers, that there are so many ways for people to convey and connect there's a connection of what people are feeling. It's like, I didn't know that's what I was feeling. And so many times those art forms touch us in different ways and, and open us up and, I, and, and protect us. I, I'm thinking very specifically the, um, the Northwell Health Nurse Choir and the revelation that it was for them in while they're rehearsing separately, when they came together, the power that they felt in the sounds of each other's voices, the vibration, the connecting with audiences, their ability to reflect um, a profession, to reflect the care of people that oftentimes go unseen. Susan, I want to play for you just the opening segment from the episode we did with the Northwell Health Nurse Choir. This really speaks to what you're referring to. Originally, it was an email that was sent to all the nurses throughout the organization looking for nurses that sang to participate in a fundraiser. It didn't even matter really for me what it was for. It was an opportunity to sing. One of my coworkers, she's like, Keisha, you need to audition for this choir. And it's so awkward. Pick a song, no music, nothing. You're just singing at your phone. And I'm just like, this is so nuts. All of these harmonies came together from all different places, different sizes and shapes and colors and talents. But meanwhile, these people hadn't met. They were still alone. They were still battling COVID. I don't know if the public really understood. We were all dealing with it in silence. As a leader, I saw a lot of my staff running out of gas. They had nothing left in their tank. It burned them out. It burned it burned yeah. all of us out. The nurses kept saying, is it going to end? Do you think it's going to end? Our mission, our ministry was, let's get out there and let's help our fellow nurses understand that they're going to be okay. Like it really brought people together. It was an unbelievable instrument of unity. And to me, what's better than that during the pandemic to be able to bring people joy and bring them together? is the joyful sound and voices of the Northwell Health Nurse Choir. In this episode, we meet two nurse choir members and the choir manager 
and hear their account of the extreme circumstances that many nurses encounter as part of their practice, how a health system's leadership demonstrates their commitment to the well-being and flourishing of their team members, and the unique power of the arts to care for the soul of healthcare. Oh, that whole episode was so wonderful. Susan, I'm curious if you've seen some of these other art forms that have been specifically practiced by healthcare professions, you know, nurses, the clergy, um, physicians, social workers. What are some of those stories that we need to know that give us a greater conviction and attraction to bringing arts into our practice as tools for healing and, and, and better health? Well, I think you you touched on this earlier in thinking about the um, the need for renewal and for rest and for um, a sense of uh, of belonging in a community where you're flat out a lot of the times and a lot of things don't make sense and don't don't make meaning. Um, a couple of things that I've seen that I think have been really amazing is when um, a community in healthcare chooses either a play or a book or a story, and they read it as one project, one one readers group, and then they have an opportunity to come together and really talk about that work and see it from different perspectives. I've also seen it where doctors and nurses and other healthcare providers have shared exchange over visual art. And there's a process called visual teaching strategies where the question is, what do you see? And it's not asking you to interpret, but to just say, what do you see? So for example, on a piece of art, it could be, you know, I see a bird and someone else may may say, I see um, a red scarf or 10, 20 people can respond to a piece of art. What else do you see? Go another round. What else do you see? And then there's a third round. Is there anything else? And there's no judgment. There's no interpretation of the painting. There's no historical background about the painting. It's really an opportunity to show that there are many ways to see the same thing. And what we found is when those programs um, are shared in healthcare communities, the transfer of those ways of seeing and observing transfer into patient care, into care between healthcare workers, because what they're they're not jumping to judgment. They're not they're not assuming they see what they see, but they're understanding that there are many opportunities to see. And I think that's that's actually a very interesting model. Certainly, in when you bring people together and they sing together, even if it's a rubbish choir, which um, I love, there is such complexity in being the singer, being with others, having an audience, the audience being able to have empathy for what you are experiencing, the feedback that you feel, that vibration from the audience. And oftentimes the cultures are very diverse and the problems or the situations that people are coming from are very diverse. So there's immediate physiological and psychological gains in those experiences. I also want to just call out the idea around the role of spaces and places. You know, we bring the world in through our senses, as I said earlier, and that means light and smell and color and biophilia and the idea of feeling the texture and the materiality of spaces. So in healthcare, When you create spaces for grieving or spaces for reflection or spaces where you can see nature, and this is for whether that's the patient, the family, the healthcare worker, when you provide these spaces for different aspects of the healthcare continuum, you also expand the ability for healing to happen sometimes faster and better. And I think that that's another area where you don't have to spend a lot of money to create spaces Um, but you need to be thoughtful about it. What does being thoughtful about creating spaces look, sound, and feel like? And how can art provide spaces for healing? We found a particularly beautiful example capturing precisely what Susan is describing. Layla Fottle reported this story for NPR's Morning Edition. Let's listen. Susanna Perlman is the founder of Art House NYC, and we meet her on the National Mall next to a brother and sister playing violin. 
Perlman is dressed in a silver blazer paired with Puma sneakers and stands in front of what looks like a tiny house in the shadow of the Washington Monument. This tiny house is an art exhibit named for Perlman's mother, Marla, a healthcare worker who died from COVID last year. And it's what inspired this project, an inviting home filled with portraits of other first responders and healthcare workers who were killed in this pandemic. More than 100 paintings, drawings, and digital artwork rotate through a series of framed flat screens hanging on the walls. My mother was always very proud of her home. She loved decorating and she loved putting together. So when I walked in here for the first time, I'm like, yeah, she'd like this. Well, let's go in and see what it is. Um, Because I see wood paneling. It really does look like a little house. You know, it just feels like a living room and gallery space. You know, we have sliding glass doors and all these windows, so a lot of very natural light comes in. You know, when the sun kind of moves over to the other side, the the images really kind of take over because they are on digital screens. And these images in front of us that we're looking at right now. These are all different healthcare workers from all over the United States created by the arthouse.nyc collective. It's interesting when I when we started this project, I felt like these two communities of the healthcare workers and our community really mirrored each other because they were from far-flung areas. I mean, here we are on the National Mall where you have tons of memorials and this was a war in its own way. So here is a monument to these individuals who gave their lives, who went to work despite the risks and and ultimately paid the ultimate price. And I just wonder, having this monument, as you describe it, what it means to memorialize these names, these faces, and the losses that so many families have suffered. Sure. I think during the pandemic, we would rarely see the faces. We'd rarely see these human lives that were behind these numbers, which I found more heartbreaking than anything else that I can think of during that whole time. It's just that these people were just being lost and forgotten. So this project brings that out. You know, you put a face with a name, you understand this person had a life, they had history, they had families, they had roots, they had, you know, the the way they lived their lives. It's more of a personal touch than the statistics. Yeah, there's like these black and white portraits, Mm -hmm. color portraits, some look more digital, some more almost like a photograph. Absolutely. I mean, we accepted anybody who wanted to participate artists of all different styles and levels, just put them in a gallery. And when the families would get in touch with us, we would make that connection. What have they said to you, the families? Have they been able to see? That has been overwhelming. People saying to me, you will never know how meaningful this was, that you reached out to us at such a dark time and did this in such a public way. Because they've many of them have felt that way, that their loved one was just taken away from them, and then nothing, nothing spoken about it. And it was, became very private when death, as sad as it is, you know, brings community together, not having that. So I think a lot of them have been so touched by it as well. You can find a link to the full piece in our show notes, and special thanks to NPR for permission to share that story. Susan, you actually have a wonderful program, and more importantly, an initiative, a blueprint, and um, a roadmap, the NeuroArts Blueprint. And what I love about this is that you have five principles, five findings, and five recommendations. When you're sharing the NeuroArts Blueprint and inviting people to use this, let's hear your description of what this blueprint is. The blueprint was um, something that came about through our lab at Johns Hopkins, beginning to query people about how things were going with arts, health, and well-being. And what we heard from about 25 people was that uh, we were ripe to really lift this up as a field, that there was science that existed, there was more research coming, practitioners really wanted to know more, and there was a huge need to bring in policy makers and funders and also the general public to really start to think about what would this look like and how would we do this. So at the very basic um, level, the blueprint really is about um, ensuring that the arts and the use of the arts in all of its forms become part of mainstream medicine and public health. And we define neural arts as a study of how arts and aesthetic experiences measurably change the brain, body, and behavior, and how this knowledge is translated into specific practices that advance health and well-being. Uh, the, the blueprint recommendations are um, in five pillars, uh, as you mentioned. 
Um, and they focus on research, they focus on the practitioners, on educational pathways, on creating sustainable, and that's underscore sustainable funding and policy, but then also building capacity, leadership, and communications at, to all the different constituencies that are there. And it took two and a half years to create the blueprint, reaching out all over the world. It's a global enterprise that really looks at moving the many, many pieces and many millions of people involved in this field into coalescing. So whether you're in public health, neurology, neuroscience, medicine, in any form, um, that your work as an artist or, or a cultural arts organization, wherever these intersections are, there is a place that is really interested in lifting this work up. And there's also, by the way, a lot of startups now that are looking at um, creating viable ways to use the arts in service of, of, of health and well-being, whether that's through um, telehealth or apps or, or other forms. We have a five-year roadmap. We're at the end of our first year, and we really are focused on three main areas. One is building infrastructure, the other is building evidence, and the third is building community. So um, we have a number of initiatives that are rolling out over the next five years that really allow us to create a very strong foundation for the field to, um, to really blossom and to have that consistency of support that's really, really needed. The Blueprint is a strategic, dedicated plan to ensure that the arts in all of its forms are there for everyone, no matter where they are. And that really requires a um, a complex choreographed approach that ensures that we bring the right messages to the right people. But it is in service of one true thing, which is I believe the arts are the highest form of hope. And I think that we have not valued that or understood that it is the arts that are really the vehicles that can help us heal. So we want to understand more about how the arts help us heal, because when we understand that, we can heal more and we can heal better. Um, and we can hopefully create the sustainability of these really extraordinary tools that we are hardwired for. I met with E.O. Wilson, who is a evolutionary biologist. He passed away this year. Um, and I was so honored to talk with him. And he, we had a fabulous conversation about um, humanity began to emerge when we captured fire and we brought it into the campfire and we sat around and we started to tell stories. And we started to illustrate those stories in movement because we entrained those stories, we embodied those stories. And so, you know, sometimes I'm in different places and people say, you know, if you could give one thing that would make a difference, what would you say? And I would say dance. I would say dance wherever you are, dance often, dance until you can't dance any longer because dance embodies all of your sensory systems. It gets you moving. It changes things inside of you. And, you know, it's funny. I see I'm in a lot of healthcare settings and it is not a day that goes by where I don't see somebody nodding their head or move into something. I think dancing changes us. It connects us, it changes us. And so I would say more dancing and more singing because it goes right to the soul of who you are. When I think about healthcare workers and clinicians and staff within the healthcare community, you know, if there was one wish I think it's that more administrators and policymakers and leaders really listen in to what the arts can do for their organizations and their employees and their staff. I feel like um, administrators and leadership are the ones that can make a huge difference to walk the talk to honor the arts and science that we know around why the arts matter and how they can really make a difference in the lives of their community or of their staff, clinicians, and also the patient population. Coming up in 
part two. Why did I get into writing songs in the beginning? I got into writing songs because I wanted to tell stories. Sometimes I want to turn my mind off. Day is just too much. Because I wanted to, to like be moved by an emotional mystery that I was lucky enough to find when I was 10 years old. So now I'm 60 and I get to do this? Wow, man, I'm the luckiest cat on the planet. And it's a service. And that's a beautiful thing, man. You know, Darden, I was really taking a cue from our last conversation when I asked you about working with healthcare team members and what kind of preparation that you do. And you said, Dick, I really don't want to know anything. I really want to go in as a fresh slate. Uh, I, I don't want to know who's there, why they're there. Um, you know, it inspired me. I, I was thinking we had such a great conversation and so unscripted, but just so from the heart. Are you telling and, me that you didn't prepare for this? Oh, no, I did. I prepared. You're trying to get out of it now? No, no, no. I prepared. But I prepared in a really different way because what I was thinking we could do is I'd love for us to kind of have a session like what you do in one of the workshops when you're working with people on the front line. Thanks to our episode guests, Susan Mag Salmon, co-director of the NeuroArts Blueprint and executive director of the International Arts and Mind Lab at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine to the nurses and music of the Northwell Health Nurse Choir. And special thanks to NPR's Morning Edition for permission to share their story with Susanna Perlman about the Hero Arts Project, honoring healthcare workers from around the world who have lost their lives while fighting COVID-19 and saving the lives of thousands of their fellow citizens. You can find links to those full stories in our show notes at seeyounowpodcast.com along with a treasure trove of episode resources. For See You Now, I'm Shauna Butler. Keep listening. Nurses are transforming healthcare through innovation, compassion, and leadership. And Johnson & Johnson is proud to continue its 125-year commitment to champion nurses through recognition, skill building, leadership development, and more. The American Nurses Association is dedicated to building a culture of innovation. Nurses improve the lives of patients and communities through innovative thinking, empathetic connection, scientific rigor, and sheer determination. ANA is proud to support and advocate for our nation's most valuable healthcare resource, our nurses. For more information on See You Now and to listen to any of the earlier episodes in our library, visit seeyounowpodcast.com.